The call came late one evening, just as I was about to give up on auditions for the day. Phone buzzed on my nat stand. It's like casting long shadows across the walls of my apartment. I had been at this acting thing for a while, taking small roles here and there, commercials, indie films, background work, and student films. Nothing major, nothing that felt like it could be the one. So when the director's assistant on the other end of the line mentioned a role in a revival of Candle Cove, I didn't think twice. I agreed before she'd even finished explaining the part. I needed the work, but more than that, I needed a break. You know how lucky you are, right? I reminded myself as I packed my things on the first day of the set. Still, something about Candle Cove unsettled me. The original 2720s TV show had long been a mystery, a lost relic that only a handful of people even remembered seeing. The old reports said it was a children's show, but those who claimed to have watched it as kids remembered strange things. Creepy marionettes, eerie music, the faint whisper of voices that never seemed quite right, and of course the infamous episode, One where all of the puppets screamed for the entire episode while Janice cried to the camera. All the while, children at home sat in front of their screens, their eyes wide open, blankly staring as the static crackled across their faces. I don't think too much about it. It was just another role, just something I could vaguely remember in the past, while doing the job now. When I arrived at the set, tucked away in an old forgotten town up north, I was immediately hit with how wrong everything felt. The crew was quiet, speaking in hushed tones, and the set itself was unnervingly accurate. They'd reconstructed the look of the show down to the finest details. Faded pastel wallpaper, cracked floors, and old-school wooden furniture that felt as though it had been left to rot in the back of a forgotten studio lot. But that wasn't what got to me. It was the puppets. They hung on wires from the ceiling, twisted and broken-looking. Pirate Percy with his wooden flute in one hand, Captain Poppy with his bright hair and beard, those were easy to recognize. The main villain, Jawbone, was a skeletal pirate puppet, with sharp yellowing teeth, its eyes hollow and dark, and a dark top hat. Its grin seemed to stretch just a little too wide, a little too long. They had made it look almost identical to the descriptions from the original show's viewers. Whoever had rebuilt them had done a disturbingly good job. Jawbone had a different name back in the original show. He also had a leather cape, but apparently they couldn't acquire the original puppet, and the director of the show was quite insistent that no one called Jawbone by the old character's name, a name that definitely wouldn't be accepted by the Hayes Law in the modern day. Apparently, the puppets were acquired from Local 58 by Inkwell Imps, a subsidiary of Inkwell Studios. From a hushed rumor between the director and one of the producers, more money was poured into restoring the puppets than towards the actors' wages. A lot of them were burned, destroyed, or hidden away in some way, but Inkwell Imps were willing to give everyone a blank check as long as Candle Cove was restored. All of the puppets of the original Candle Cove in the same room for the new show. All puppets but one. It shook off the unease. It was a set. It was make-believe. It was cast as one of the parents, a supporting role in the new iteration of Candle Cove. The idea was that this version would show that the adults didn't see how the parents ignored the warning signs. How they failed to realize their children were, were being drawn into something far darker than a simple television show. The director was passionate intense, and he seemed determined to capture the creeping horror of the original. A meta-story within a story, a story told by the puppets and Janice's adventures, and the story of how the parents didn't see the strangeness around the show. Almost like recording two different shows each day. The first few days went by smoothly enough. I had my scenes, interacting with the kids as they sat glued to the TV, 
oblivious to everything around them. The other actors were professional. The, chil the kids were good. But there was a growing sense of something off. It started small, little things like how the puppets would be in different positions when I walked onto set. One moment, Jawbone would be dangling limply. The next, it would be staring directly at the camera. Its crooked mouth opened wider, like it was silently screaming. At first, I thought it was the crew adjusting them between tapes. But then the crew started noticing it too. They'd swear they hadn't moved a thing. One night, after we wrapped shooting, I was walking past the prop room when I heard it. A faint static buzz. It was soft at first, barely audible, but as I stepped closer, it grew louder. The prop room was cracked open, and inside, the static pulse from an old TV set propped up in the corner, flickering on and off. I peeked inside, curiosity getting the better of me. The TV was tuned to nothing but static, yet there was something underneath it, barely perceptible, like whispers trapped in the noise. I stepped closer, leaning in, struggling to hear. My breath caught when I made out a few words. Coming closer. Stay and watch. He jerked back, my heart pounding. The room was empty, just me, the static, and those lifeless puppets hanging from the ceiling, swaying gently as if moved by an invisible breeze. The next day, the kids on set started acting stranger. They'd sit quietly between takes, staring at the TV, even when it wasn't turned on. Their wide, glassy eyes reflected the cold light of the set. I tried talking to one of them, a little girl named Sophie, who played Janice. She usually ran around and played between scenes. She just looked at me, her head tilting slightly, her expression blank. They want to watch now, she said, her voice distant. Who does? I asked, feeling the chill creep up my spine. The ones inside the TV. They want to play with us. A cold shudder passed through me, and I tried to laugh it off. It's just pretend, remember? The TV isn't even on. She just smiled, a slow, unsettling grin, and turned back to the screen. By the time we were shooting the final scenes, the air on set felt thick, oppressive. The crew was tense, the kids eerily quiet. That day, they filmed the infamous episode, the one where the children stare blankly at the TV, unblinking, unmoving. I stood in the back, playing my part as the oblivious parent, but something was wrong. The kids weren't acting. Their, ki their faces were too still, too pale. Their eyes were locked onto the screen. Pupils dilated as the static flickered across their faces. The puppets dangled in the background, and I swore I could see them moving, twitching on their own. I felt something pulling at me, like a thread slowly unraveling. I could hear the faint whispers again, just like in the prop room. They were calling to me, pulling me closer to the screen. I tried to shake it off, but my legs wouldn't move. I was rooted to the spot, my gaze locked onto the children as they stared into the abyss, their mouths hanging slightly open as if in a trance. And then the static on the screen shifted. For just a moment, I saw something else, dark figures moving within the fuzz, shadowy hands reaching out from the depths of the TV. The director yelled, Cut! But no one moved. The crew stood frozen, the kids remained still, and my heart raced in my chest, and I realized something was horribly wrong. I wasn't just acting anymore. Whatever we were filming, whatever we recreated, it had come to life. And we were all trapped in it. The puppets, the whisper, the static, it had all become real. The director yelled, Cut! again. His voice strained, but still, no one moved. The eerie silence pressed in, thick and stifling, like the very air had turned against us. I could hear the faint crackle of static in my ears. 
a low hum that seemed to vibrate through my skull. The children remained frozen, their eyes wide, locked onto the TV screen as if it had claimed them. I wanted to run, to scream, but my body wouldn't obey. Something was pulling me toward the TV, an invisible force that seemed to tug at my very bones. My breath hitched in my throat as I felt my mind slipping, unraveling like a frayed thread being pulled too tight. The shadows within the static moved again, those dark figures reaching out, their limbs impossibly long, fingers stretching toward us, toward me. I wasn't the only one who noticed. One of the crew members, Mike, stood closest to the TV. His hand trembled as he slowly reached toward the screen, as if in a trance. His eyes were vacant, classy, reflecting the flickering static. Mike, don't, I managed to choke out, my voice barely a whisper. But he didn't stop. His fingertips brushed the screen, and for a moment, everything went still. Then all at once, the static roared to life. The sound was deafening, a high-pitched screech that clawed at my ears, and the screen seemed to ripple like water. Mike's body convulsed, his mouth opening in a silent scream as his hands sank into the TV, swallowed whole by the shifting static. I watched in horror as his arm disappeared up to the elbow, and then his shoulder. He struggled, his face contorted with pain, but it was too late. The TV pulled him in, inch by inch, until there was nothing left but the empty, buzzing screen. I wanted to scream, but the sound caught in my throat, stuck there like a jagged shard of glass. Then the children moved. It was subtle at first, just the smallest twitch of their he heads, but their movements were wrong, jerky, too sharp like marionettes being yanked by invisible strings. Their faces remained blank, eyes glassy, as they turned in unison to face me. My heart slammed in my chest as their mouths stretched into eerie slow-motion smiles. Too wide, too perfect. We're going to Candle Cove now, Sophie whispered, her voice no longer her own. It was layered with something darker, older, like a chorus of voices speaking through her small body. The children echoed her words, their voices blending into a single hypnotic chant. We're going to Candle Cove. I tried to back away, but my feet wouldn't move. I could feel something creeping up my legs, something cold and heavy, like invisible ropes wrapping around my ankles, rooting me to the floor. My shin prickled as if tiny hands were brushing over me, tugging, pulling. I wasn't in control anymore. The children started to walk toward me, their movements stiff like dolls being pushed across a stage. My heart raced, every instinct screaming at me to run, but there was no escape. The air itself seemed to bend and warp around me, thickening with the scent of damp earth and mildew, like we were sinking into something old and forgotten. The static on the TV shifted again, and this time I saw it clearly. C figures standing in the mist, their faces pale and distorted, watching from the other side of the screen. They were like shadows, draped in old clothes, their eyes empty, voids of darkness. One of them smiled, a slow, grotesque twist of its lips, as it beckoned toward to us. The children reached me, their cold hands latching onto my arms. I tried to shake them off, but their grip was stronger than it should have been, their fingers digging into my skin like claws. I could feel the static now, crawling under my flesh buzzing through my veins. My vision blurred, the edges of the room dissolving into a haze of fog and shadow. I was being pulled in, just like Mike. 
I opened my mouth to scream, but the sound that came out wasn't mine. It was the static, a crackling, disjointed voice that echoed through my head, filling every corner of my mind. I could feel myself slipping away, my thoughts unraveling. My body became lighter, like I was no longer anchored to the real world. We're going to Candle Cove, the children repeated, the words wrapping around me like a chant. The last thing I saw before everything went black was the TV screen flickering, the shadowy figures reaching out from the static, their hands stretching towards me, their faces twisting into hollow smiles. When I was when I woke up, I wasn't on the set anymore. I was standing on the deck of an old rotting pirate ship, the wood creaking beneath my feet. I was on the laughing stock. The fog was thick, swirling around me like smoke, and in the distance I could hear the faint sounds of laughter, children's laughter, hollow and distorted, carried on the wind. The sea below me was black, turning with dark, unseen shapes, moving just beneath the surface. I turned, and there they were. The children from the set, standing in a line, their eyes still glassy, their smiles frozen. Behind them stood the puppets, their strings trailing up into the mist, pulled by something I couldn't see. Jawbone stood at the center, his skeletal grin stretched wide, his hollow eyes staring right through me. This was Candle Cove, the real Candle Cove. I had been brought here, transformed, just like the others. I could feel the weight of the place pressing down on me, the inescapable pool of the static still buzzing in my mind. I was no longer an actor, no longer playing a part. I had become part of the show, and there was no way out. The puppets began to move, their wooden limbs creaking as they danced in slow, jerky movements. The children swayed with them, their voices rising in a soft, haunting song that echoed through the fog. I could feel it pulling at me, pulling me deeper into the madness of Candle Cove. I stood frozen on the deck of the ship, my mind teetering on the edge of panic. The fog wrapped around me like a suffocating blanket, thick and heavy, making it hard to breathe. I could hear the static crackling in my ears like an invisible tether, still pulling me back to that cursed television screen. Everything felt unreal, like I was caught in a fever dream I couldn't wake up from. Yet every creak of the ship beneath my feet, every rustle of the wind through the tattered sails, felt too real as if this place had always existed, waiting for us to stumble into it. The children were still watching me, their glassy eyes empty, fixed on me with unsettling intensity. They swayed to the eerie melody of their song, their smiles frozen, unnatural, as if they were being controlled by invisible strings. The sound of their voices sent chills crawling down my spine, a mixture of innocence and something far more sinister. I tried to back away, but there was nowhere to go. Behind me, the sea churned and bubbled dark shapes, moving beneath the surface, rising and falling in the water like shadows. I was trapped on this ship with these children and the puppets, the twisted skeletal figure of Jawbone at the center of it all, his hollow eyes locked onto mine. Unlike the other puppets that stood at the edge of the laughing stock, Jawbone's strings did not end in the fog. Something not far above us held its strings. Something inside of me my curiosity, my desire to understand, or maybe something else inside of me followed the strings above. Up and up above, I could see why Inkwell imps never found the skin taker's puppet. The skin taker sat in the ship's crow's nest, and when he saw that I saw him, 
he slid down on a rope, letting Jawbone's puppet body fall. If Jawbone was unsettling, the skin taker was something else entirely. We could see the yellowing of his bone, and his teeth were gleaming white as his jaw slid forward and back. Bits of blood and skin still stuck between his teeth. Unlike the puppets, unlike the children, unlike me, he did not move like he was on strings. In all of Candle Cove, the skin taker was the only one free of strings. Both his top hat and cape were made with, from the skin of so many children, and his cape so long that it trailed behind him, and even when the skin taker turned to inspect everyone on the ship, I could see dim features of children still on the skin, places where the face could still be seen, where the eyes stared blankly out into the static, the same look the children had on set. A sharp, cold realization crept over me. This was the show, the real Candle Cove, the one that everyone who had watched it as a child had only half remembered. I had become part of its twisted narrative. We all had. I felt a flicker of something deep inside me, a primal instinct telling me to fight, to push back against whatever was happening. The static in my mind was growing louder, more insistent, drowning out my thoughts. I could feel it worming its way into my brain, clouding my memories, making it hard to hold on to who I was. Who was I? The edges of my identity felt frayed, as though I was being rewritten, reshaped to fit into this new world. The children continued their soft, haunting chant, their voices intertwining with the crackling static. I felt something tug at my chest. It pulled deeper into this place. It was as if the longer I stood there, the more I belonged to it, and the less I belonged to the world I'd known. I clenched my fists, desperate to hold on to something. My name, my face, my memories. I couldn't let them take it all from me. But the pull was so strong. The static was everywhere, buzzing in my ears, slipping into my thoughts like tendrils of smoke. The children stepped closer, their hands outstretched, reaching for me. Their touch was cold, like ice. I flinched, but there was no pain, just a dull numbness that spread through me, stealing away the warmth of my skin. They were pulling me in, piece by piece, and I could feel myself fading. I was becoming a shadow, like them. No, I whispered, though my voice sounded distant, as if it was coming from somewhere outside of me. This isn't real. It can't be. But the skin taker's grin stretched even wider, his skeletal jaw creaking as he tilted his head. Somehow his bones could stretch and flex. His empty eyes seemed to glow with a faint, unnatural light. And in that moment, I knew there was no escape. The laughing stock lurched beneath my feet, and I stumbled, my hands clutching at the rough wood of the railing. The fog swirled around us, thick and choking. Through it, I could see shapes, by distant figures standing in the mist. They looked like people, lost and drifting, their faces pale and ghostly. Some of them were children, others were adults. All of them were trapped here, just like me. They were part of the show now, part of Candle Cove. My knees buckled and I collapsed to the deck, gasping for breath. The static was roaring in my head, louder than ever, a cacophony of voices and whispers pulling me under. The children circled around me, their cold hands touching my skin, their eyes wide and empty. I could feel my own mind slipping away, my thoughts unraveling like smoke in the wind. 
and through the fog of static, a single memory surfaced. My grandmother's face, her soft, wrinkled hands holding mine, as she whispered stories of protection, of old magic passed down through generations. She had always been wise, always warned me to stay grounded in myself, to never lose my sense of who I was. So I climbed to my feet as I recalled the story in my memories. Once there was a little girl who dreamt of a fair world, a kind world, a world where good people lived, where children did not fear the darkness, where the darkness feared children, a place where people lived courageously, bravely, and freely. You have to go inside, a deep voice said, reverberating through the entire ship, shaking my footing and where I nearly fell to my hands and knees in front of the skin taker. The laughing stock just spoke, and I knew what it was trying to get me to do. But I looked in the skin taker's empty eyes, and in the supernatural light, I saw a spark of something that I didn't know a dead man could feel. The skin taker was afraid. Once there was a little girl who grew up, and she saw that the world she lived in wasn't the world she dreamed of. She saw an unfair world, a cruel world, a world where evil people lived, where all feared the darkness and the darkness feared none, a place where people lived fearfully, fitfully, and enslaved. The skin taker laughed again, but I noticed something that I would have thought impossible just a moment ago. He took a step back, away from me, and for a brief moment I thought I heard silence from the children. So the little girl, now a young woman, decided to make her world. She decided to be fair, kind, and brave, even when the world wasn't. And she made her world possible. With every kind word, with every moment of bravery, and with every fair act, she made her world. A world where I get to live, because it's a world that I help make. I reminded myself, reciting my grandmother's story to myself. I clung to that memory like a lifeline, holding on with everything I had left. This is not the end, I whispered to myself, my voice barely audible over the roar in my head. I will not be part of their story. I have my own story. And with all the strength I had left, I pushed against the cold, the static, the numbness creeping through me. I focused on the warmth of my grandmother's hands, the soft cadence of her voice, and something shifted inside of me. I felt the pole of Candle Cove loosen, just for a moment, just enough for me to act. I stood up, shaky but defiant, my fists clenched at my sides. Children hesitated, their glassy eyes flickering with confusion. The skin taker's head tilted. His hollow gaze fixed on me, but he did not move. This isn't your world, I said, my voice stronger now. It's mine. I took a step forward, forcing my way through the fog, through the cold, past the children who tried to pull me back. Each step felt like I was wading through thick, heavy water, but I kept moving. The static screamed in my ears louder and louder, but I didn't stop. I reached the edge of the ship, and without hesitating, I threw myself over the side. For a moment, there was only darkness. Cold, crushing darkness that swallowed me whole. But then the static faded. The whispers silenced. The cold loosened its grip on me. When I opened my eyes, I was standing back on the soundstage, flickering light of the TV screen casting shadows on the walls. The set was quiet. The children were gone. Puppets hung limp from their strings, lifeless. The fog had lifted, and the oppressive weight that had clung to me was gone. I took a deep breath, my heart still racing, 
but I was free. I had made it out. But as I looked around the empty set, a chill ran down my spine. I knew deep down that Candle Cove wasn't done with me. It never would be, because once you've been part of the show, you're never truly free. But that didn't mean I couldn't fight back.